Hi mom, how are you doing with this first week of the slow living challenge? Yeah, actually it's really interesting. For those of you listening who might not be participating in our four week slow living challenge, the topic for this week is food. And the challenge activity is to plan and prepare an entire meal that is as locally sourced and as seasonal as possible. And we've been hearing from a lot of our participants about their efforts in meeting this challenge. And it's been so much fun reading about what people are planning and what they're getting and the insights they're having into their own food habits. It's really been interesting and fun. Yeah, I've really loved following along in the Almanac, uh, which is where our Slow Living Challenge is taking place this year. If you haven't already joined us, there's still time to join us. It's in a free section of the Almanac, so you can try it out before you decide to join us in the paid section. But yeah, I guess for you, Mom, the slow food part isn't too much of a challenge because you normally eat pretty seasonally and locally, right? Yes, that's generally true, but I had a bit of an aha moment yesterday when I caught myself sort of caught up in the food should be convenient for me mindset. What was that? Well, when we picked up at the CSA yesterday, there was a notice that the milk was being limited to a half gallon per share until spring when the cows calved. That's a lot less than we usually get. And at first I thought, oh no, Uh, what about all my kefir and my cheese? And we really, really enjoy that milk. This is our first year in a cow share, so I had never experienced that before. And I almost started to have this sort of not enough feeling, but I caught myself and I said, wait, (laughs) this is seasonal eating. In the spring, before the milk cows calve, they need a drying off period before birthing to keep the lactose cycle robust for the new calves and for the humans they're sharing their milk with. So this is how nature works. It is the cycle of the year and it's just part of the cooperative dance we have with the earth and the animals. And it's what's necessary for us and the animals well-being if our intention is to eat sustainably. So it was a real learning for me. It was great. So now how do you feel about having so much less milk than you're used to. Well, not only am I okay with it, but given the opportunity to think about it in this way, I actually feel privileged and honored to have the opportunity to embrace this in a really personal way. You know, in this age of supermarkets and Costco's and any number of other mega suppliers, not many people really have a chance to experience this, even if they wanted to. We know how hard it is to find a reliable source for straight from the farm milk. And I've come to really appreciate what it takes. And that, I think, is what this week's Slow Living Challenge is about. As always, it's about awareness. And usually it's a challenge. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. So, you know, if I was thinking, oh, this will be easy for me. I do it all the time. I had something else coming. Yeah. And on that note, I'll also add, I also thought this will be easy for me. I do this all the time. But this week, we've kind of been scrounging in our pantry, which I guess is kind of slow living. Like, we've been really eating what we have. But, you know, pasta and pre-packaged sauces and stuff, I really haven't done my local meal this week. So at the time of this recording, I have not yet done it. But... I will, by the end of the week, I plan to go to the market and to my favorite local bakery that sources all local wheat, and I'm excited to partake as well. Yes, so all of you out there doing the Slow Living Challenge with us, keep those stories coming. We love it. And we really are doing it right alongside with you. We are. (laughs) We we really are. (laughs) No joke. So, okay, Emma, so what's up on the good dirt this week? I'm so excited to introduce this episode. We have such a good episode today. I have to say, I mean, I feel this way about all of our episodes, but this really is one of my favorite ones I think that we've done so far. We are talking to our friend and neighbor, Tony Cohen, who runs the Button Farm Living History Center 
which is a 40-acre living history farm historic property inside the Seneca Creek State Park in Germantown, Maryland, which is just one town over from where my parents live on the farm. Button Farm is Maryland's only living history center dedicated to depicting 19th century slave plantation life and is the main project of the Minari Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the preservation of underground railroad history, historic sites and environments, and to the creation of vibrant educational programs. I'm so excited about this interview, especially the part of it that includes the property we live on in Montgomery County. So listen for that. But before we get into that, Emma, you want to tell them about the spring grow your own food intensive? Sure. If you are planning your spring garden, make sure that you've checked out our upcoming grow your own food planting intensive. That's all about the planting calendar. It's a three hour workshop on Saturday, March 13th. All of the information is on our website. We have our guest workshop leaders, Nikki and Dave Schauder from Permaculture Gardens, and they are just really the best. So we're so excited to work with them. If you sign up, you get your own personalized planting calendar. You got to sign up by March 6th, though, for your personalized planting calendar. You also get three months free in the paid Premier Almanac membership, which is amazing. And we're also adding in a little seed swap for those who are participating in the intensive. So if you come, you'll have access to everyone else in the workshop and their seed collection, and we'll coordinate a swap that way. So we really hope you join us and get all prepped for your spring garden this year. That's March 13th, and all the information is on the website. The spring intensive is going to be great, and we hope you enjoy this episode. This is Tony Cohen. Tony, tell us about yourself and how you came to Button Farm and what you do there with the Min. Oh gosh, is it the Menar Foundation? We pronounce it Menair. A Menair, but, um, okay. It probably it probably is Menari, and that's a great place to start. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, the word was actually a passcode used on the Underground Railroad in Kentucky, and it came to us by way of a 1937 interview for the Works Progress Administration of former enslaved people. And the man who was interviewed was named Arnold Gragston. He was 97 years old in 1936 or 37. And he was living in Florida, but was formerly from Kentucky. And he told the story of being a young enslaved boy growing up near the Ohio River, and that he fell into an agreement with a man named John Fee, who was a abolitionist minister from Kentucky. I believe Fee started Berea College as the first oh, yeah. racially integrated college. Uh, that was, I think, in the 1830s. And Fee ran a fairly open station of the Underground Railroad. And so he recruited Graxton to shuttle slaves across the Ohio River from Maysville, Kentucky to Ripley, Ohio. And everyone was, you know, all the slaveholders were out, you know, keeping their eye on fee. So I think he had this series of meeting places and passcodes that you had to use successfully in order to access his route of the Underground Railroad. And one of those passwords was Menare, M-E-N-A-R-E. When Gragston was interviewed, it appears that the interviewer asked him what it meant. And he said he wasn't sure, but he thought it was from the Bible. So in 1999, when I was forming the Monero Foundation, I knew I wanted to form a nonprofit. At the time, I had the name the North Star Foundation. I thought that was clever, but when I went to incorporate, there was like, 5,000 North Star Foundation. Of course. That idea. (laughs) So I was looking for a name that would be unique. And I came across the word in Graxton's thing. So I went to a religious scholar 
at, I think it was Catholic University. And he told me that there was no direct biblical presence of the word M-E-N-A-R-E, but he thought it might be the Minari or the Minaruth and described the story from the Bible where Moses leads people out of Egypt and then wandered in the desert and that they were called the Minari or the Minaruth. So I thought, hey, that's that's an interesting <laughs> connection of being, you know, led out of bondage. So then in around 2001, 2002, we were operating under the name, but by that time, the power of the internet had gotten stronger. And I remember Googling what I pronounce Monere, probably should be Monare. (laughs) And the word started showing up on Italian language websites. And so I looked it up and in Italian, M-E-N-A-R-E means to lead or guide someone on a journey. In French, it means the path or the way. And then I think in Spanish, it's M-A-N-E-R-E and it means the path or the journey. So So, cool. Yeah. I got goosebumps. That's awesome. So tell us what the genesis of your wanting to even begin the nonprofit and how that feeds into that and where you are at Button Farm today. Yeah. So the nonprofit was started as a way of funneling public interest into some kind of charitable end that was sparked by a project that I started in 1996 when I walked a route of the Underground Railroad from Montgomery County, Maryland to Canada. And leading up to that, I had been a history major at American University in the early 90s, graduating in 94. And for my senior project, I had to write a paper about some part of history that had gone unrecorded. So I chose the story of the Underground Railroad and I used Montgomery County as my area of focus and wrote my paper, ended up publishing it as a small press monograph through the uh, Montgomery County Historical Society. And the book was a bestseller. I started being invited to go out and speak to school groups. And at one of those presentations I did, I think it was for, for a fourth grade class in Rockville, somebody asked me thinking that since I knew so much about the Underground Railroad, I had actually traveled the Underground Railroad myself as a runaway slave coming to their class. (laughs) And (laughs) it just gave me this idea. I thought, well, what if I were to actually follow some of the routes that I had documented passing through our county, seeing where they led to, what would that be like? Would I be able to recover history that way? would I learn more about the Underground Railroad by visiting the places that it existed in? So in May of 1996, I walked from Sandy Spring, Maryland to Buffalo, New York, where I crossed the Niagara River, eight weeks, five states, about 800 miles. And then in 1998, I did a second walk from Alabama to Canada, three months, 10 states, about a little over a thousand miles, I believe and crossed into Canada from Detroit. And by that time, I had done the two walks. I had worked with Oprah Winfrey on a project. I had started doing uh, documentaries and interviews, and it just seemed the time to take that kind of wellspring of interest in the topic and funnel it to an organization that could kind of bring the story into the 21st century. So that's the short version. That's awesome. I have a quick question. Is that book still around? Can people get that book? Yeah. So the book was called The Underground Railroad in Montgomery County, A History and Driving Guide. It is no longer in print. It went through three printings at 500 printings each, sold out each one. But two years ago, uh, we applied for and received grant funding through Heritage Montgomery and Maryland Heritage Areas Authority to do an expanded version. So we were going to do a 25th anniversary edition, and then we realized that the story had grown so much 
in the past quarter since we learned so much more about the Underground Railroad that we decided instead to do a full book on the Underground Railroad in Maryland. So that's coming out in June of 2021, and it's called Great Escapes, Journeys on Maryland's Underground Railroad, and part of uh, uh, history and part travelogue, and uh, it'll have self-guided tours in it, and it will have the core of the book. That is so exciting. Tony, I- I've known you for several years now. I did, did not know about the big walks. That's amazing. <laughs> I think we could probably do a whole episode on just those journeys. Oh my gosh. A whole series. Did, <laughs> yes. On your walking, were you able to decipher, like probably you could tell town to town, but exact routes at all? I mean, were you able to do some of that? And, and I'm just curious, did it take you into urban areas? I mean, so much has obviously changed in the couple hundred years since all this was taking place, but you know, what kind of environments were you walking in and was it true to the path that they took or do you even know? Yes. So all of the above, actually, when I started out of Montgomery County, I started from Sandy Spring and I took Route 108 out of the county into Howard County because I believe that that was the route of the Underground Railroad. The Sandy Spring Laurel Road was the byway that the Quakers used to connect their meetings and also a, just a regular transportation route. And so uh, what I did as I went along was I followed the general corridor of the Underground Railroad. As I went through Maryland and into Pennsylvania and New York, I was able to, you know, do some documentation along the way. And and my modus was to stop in towns along the way and ask people what they knew about the Underground Railroad. And what I discovered was that much of the highway system here on the East Coast has origins going back, you know, two centuries or more. So I might have been walking along the edge of a highway that was, you know, once a toll road or private passageway. So I was able to tap into the routes and quite easily, and then here and there, get some real specifics. As I went along, I would stop in towns and I would always look for a library, historical society, or museum and got some good information that way. I would also find the postmaster because he or she always knew who the oldest person in town was or who the town historian was. And then I could get an audience with them. In lieu of that, I would often go to a realtor's office because they knew the history of the oldest homes in the community, which ones were either documented or alleged to have been underground railroad safe houses. And they frequently knew who lived at them because often those were the oldest families in the community. So I figured out ways to kind of shortcut to the direct information and get back on the road (laughs) the next day. So I would say that most of the Underground Railroad geographically and culturally can still be found. Wow. Well, that leads me to the next question. As we have talked about previously, the house we're living in here in Montgomery County dates from early 19th century. And anecdotally, we have this little space underneath one of the rooms in the older part of the house, which ironically, I'm actually sitting right above that right now. That wasn't planned. (laughs) I had to flee from some workers doing some hammering and stuff on the other side of the house. So I said, oh, I'll just try this little room. And then I got all set up and I thought, oh, I'm right on top of that. We don't have any real proof of it. And you've done so much research. And you and I talked recently on the phone about some information regarding the Underground Railroad that does involve our property. So talk about that a little bit. I think there's this big connection here and um, I want to hear about it. I'm curious. (laughs) Absolutely. Maybe just start by saying what the Underground Railroad was. It was a loosely to uh, tightly organized system of escape, which featured sanctuary locations, sometimes safe houses where people were sheltered at night, but mainly outbuildings such as, you know, 
of barns and spring houses and a place where someone escaping slavery could stop and refuel and uh, get directions and assistance uh, that they needed. In the North, there are documented cases of homes having secret rooms or passageways, usually subterranean passageways were tunnels that led from one building to the next. So if one building was being searched, the passengers could go to the next building via the tunnel and then vice versa. Is that true? Did Uh, you see any of those when you were on your walk? Yes, actually, I believe the first place that kind of fit that bill was Pine Forge Academy in uh, Pottstown, Pennsylvania, which was the home of of an abolitionist at the time. Now it's a Seventh-day Adventist school, but, you know, there was a underground cellar and it had a bricked over section in one of the walls, I believe, if I recall correctly. And no one, I guess, had been through to the other side but suspected that the passageway continued and went to an outbuilding. I went through there in 96, so I'm not sure what they've done in the past 25 years for uh, research or whatnot, but um, I know it was a point of pride for that location. And even in Sandy Spring, Maryland, there are accounts, for instance, in like the annals of Sandy Spring of buildings that were uh, Quaker-owned that had, I think one was described as having a unnecessary amount of cellar space or something like that. But in the South, it's more unlikely to find or to document hiding places within a home because it was just, you know, you're still in slave territory. So you wanted to move people quickly. And the organized aspect of the Underground Railroad was far more loose in the South of the Mason-Dixon line. And more organized and highly motivated in the you know north of the Mason Dixon line. So hiding spaces in homes are still a big question mark for underground railroad scholars. Your house is interesting or your farm specifically is interesting because it was one site in the early 1830s, I think between 1831 and 32 where what we would think of as a stampede of enslaved people escaped from. So the area around your farm, some homes owned by uh, the O'Neills and uh, Peter family um, that were, you know, farms that were connected through family links. It appears a conspiracy amongst their enslaved people of probably about five different farms happened. And uh, many of those, I think it was 14 in all over a period of a year escaped, uh, some successfully reaching uh, Pennsylvania. That's awesome. Is that related at all to Sugarland? I guess Sugarland was technically after the Civil War that was established, but that freed slave community is half a mile down the road from our farm. So I'm wondering. Yeah, I, I, I would say so. It's a great possibility. While Sugarland was, I, I, I believe, established in 1871, I should have my copy of uh, the new book, but those formerly enslaved communities, which emerged after the Civil War, were essentially just breaking ground. These are communities that in one form or fashion had been there for a while. You know, it could have been a collective of people who were all enslaved on Uh, one or more plantations. Frequently, the slave quarters or slave community on Montgomery County plantations were later divided. The parcels were divided and sold to the people that were formerly enslaved there. So, you know, while a new community might appear on the map, it might have been the old slave quarter uh, community. So that's an area of scholarship that really no one's doing much work in, and I think it's a real important work. So hopefully one day we'd be able to answer that question. But yes, that community emerged right from the heart of the area we're speaking of. Right. So do you think it's a possibility that some of the descendants of the group that left here in the 1830s 
came back and possibly lived at Sugarland, like in an attempt to come home and seek out their roots and so forth? Yes, we know that, for instance, the Martins who established Toby Town were likely part of the group that, you know, escaped in the 1830s and then were either captured or brought back or returned later. We're, we're not quite sure about that. As a researcher, you know, I'm constantly trying to figure out ways of tracing those journeys and especially the impact after the war, you know, did people come back to the communities? And I developed a method. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there are a number of methods out there, but I developed a method that I find pretty uh, interesting and others can try it at home. So I use my Ancestry.com account and anyone who uh, has one of those knows that they make it as easy as they can to connect your search with their you know, massive database, which includes census records. So when you go to the search page on an Ancestry account, it says, enter the name of a person you're looking for. And then there are all these little drop downs and things that can more clearly define your search. So if you know the date of birth or where they lived or whatnot. So what I do is I pull up the screen for the 1870 and 1880 census. I enter nobody's name in the search column, but there's a keyword bar. I put in the keyword Canada. And then under lived in, I put in the word Maryland. Then I drop down to the race category and I put in the word black. And if you put in black, anything like Negro, colored, mulatto will also come up in the search. And then I hit search. And uh -huh. what it will reveal is people in the Montgomery County 1870 census who at one time lived in Canada, but now were residing in Montgomery County who are African American. And so I have been able to find families who in the 1870 census, it shows like the head of the household was born in Maryland, a spouse born in Maryland, three of the four children born in Maryland, but one was born in Canada. Well, how did that happen? Yeah. And you can tell by the dates that this family escaped, got to Canada during the time of, you know, 1860, whatnot, lived there, had one child, then came back to Maryland and had their other children. That and is brilliant. So, yes. <laughs> but and you so I'm with... taking some of those and then starting to trace those people down to living descendants today to first of all find out if they know about their ancestor and if they don't then you know share that information with them that their legacy comes from the underground railroad that's so fun so do you literally call people up and you're like hi i'm tony <laughs> yes yeah, so, um, um in fact i i called one person up so far <laughs> using this method who actually knew of their family's involvement with the underground railroad but didn't know who was involved it was just a family lore yeah and, yeah, yeah. and actually the lore was that they had a branch of their family in canada but no one knew who they were so it wasn't even the story of the Underground Railroad. <laughs> wow, that's got to be so fun to tell people it is, about it. <laughs> it is, and um, hopefully can do more of that. Some of those stories we're hoping to in include in the book, Great Escapes. So. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait to see that. Have you reached out to anybody in Toby Town? Is, is that community now completely disconnected from its roots or, or not? Yeah, I haven't reached out to anyone in Toby Town Back in the early 2000s, I was brought on as a local historian for an oral history project for Toby Town. I think the Montgomery County Housing Authority sponsored that and wanted to get more of the community's history. And so I did the research and, you know, for them, gave them the uh, documentation. I'm not sure what's happened with it, but there's stuff out there. For those of you listening, we're speaking of little communities like Sugarland and Toby Town, which are very close to where we are here in Montgomery County, Maryland. Sugarland is literally a mile down the road 
and Toby town is probably more like five or six miles away, but these are communities that are historically African American communities that popped up after the civil war. So that's what we're talking about. Tony, can we go back a little bit and hear about your personal history and even things I'm not, I don't know, like I'm assuming you're from Maryland and you're, you know, now I know you went to AU, but kind of tell us about your entree into all of this. And then I also, I don't know if this is included in this answer, but how you chose to start at Sandy Spring. Sure. So a little bit about my background. I'm from Washington, D.C., born and raised, born at the old Sibley Hospital on Capitol Hill. And my parents, father was from Georgia, mom was from Texas. They moved uh, to Washington in the late 50s and met each other while they were in grad programs at Howard University. And around 1968, we moved from the city to Montgomery County to a community called Kemp Mill, part of Silver Spring, Maryland. And Kemp Mill was largely a Jewish community with many Holocaust survivors, actually. Both my parents are African-American, but we have the name Cohen. (laughs) So we kind of blended in in a strange way. And it was a really great place to grow up. Years later, I tried to get an answer to the question that had been asked of me all of my life. And that was, you know, your last name's Cohen? C-O-H-E-N? Are you doing? How does that happen? How does a black guy end up with a Jewish last name? So in 1989, I called my father's father, who was living in LA at the time. And I said, granddad, how, how did we get this name? And he said that his father had been born in Philadelphia during the Civil War, orphaned, and then adopted by a Jewish family from Wilmington, Delaware. And that's how we got the name. And then he said, as a young man, his father came to Savannah, Georgia, while working on a steamship and never left. Georgia steamship, all documented. I've had no problem with that. Cannot find the origin of the name, the Jewish family, whatnot. So that remains a mystery. But that's what launched me on my journey to do my family history, to uncover my family story, and eventually led me to take on that project at AU and pursue a a degree in history and American studies. So what's in a name? (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. Um, Oh, right. So Sandy Spring. So I decided to start my journey from Sandy Spring because the Sandy Spring community and its Quaker roots had a number of ties to the history of the Underground Railroad that had been overlooked in the past. I think when people think of the Underground Railroad, they immediately think of, you know, a safe house hiding place. And while that may have been the case, we have some evidence for that in Sandy Spring. The story that's really there to be told is of the community's members and their ties to both Baltimore anti-slavery individuals and groups, as well as Pennsylvania's. So Sandy Spring stood on a line of escape. Over the years, we've actually found primary documents, firsthand accounts of people who lived there during the times before the Civil War. And it appears that while the Quakers were sympathetic and may have aided with information and things like this, uh, guidance for uh, runaways, the active members were most likely part of the free Black community. There was one woman who ran a station, and we've now found her family in Canada and then back in the United States. Tell us about your association with the Harriet Tubman Museum and how you came to that. And then I want you to tell the story about your experience with Oprah Winfrey. After my 96 walk, my professional career 
I became pretty much a known historian of the Underground Railroad and began doing lots of consulting work. In the early 2000s, the state of Maryland wanted to commemorate the story of Harriet Tubman in the landscape where she grew up and where she operated her rescue missions. So a location was established on the eastern shore on the outskirts of Blackwater Wildlife Refuge to place a museum there in her honor and also tell the story of her network and the Underground Railroad on the Eastern Shore. I was asked to be part of public workshops on it. That led to some consulting work. I was on the exhibit design team for the museum and also was a consultant on the byway project, the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad Byway, which is a 124-mile historical route through both Dorchester and Caroline counties that links up different historical resources, sites, communities to tell the story of the Underground Railroad on the Eastern Shore. In recent years, the Monero Foundation has opened a branch of our operation uh, that we call Chesapeake Tours, uh, where we take people on guided tours of the byway and uh, some of the less seen historical places and resources which tell that story. And we've also expanded to the Western Shore, as they like to call it. It's all about putting history in people's hands. For our friend Oprah, it's an interesting story. I I met Oprah in October of 1996. This was a few months after my walk to Canada had ended. I had traveled the last 10 days of my walk with Smithsonian Magazine, and they did a story which came out in their, I think it was the October issue, 1996 of Smithsonian Magazine about my walk, which Oprah read and then uh, asked me to come on her show as a guest. And so I went on and I told my story and it was pretty cool. Like I, I was on her show and the day I told my story, she told me that she had just bought the rights to Toni Morrison's Beloved to do it as a film. And she was going to star in the film playing the role of Setha, the runaway woman from Kentucky based on a real life story who crossed as the Ohio with her children but is tracked down by her owner. And instead of going back to the terror that she experienced at his hands, she kills her children. So they will never have to be enslaved again. Oprah brings this up because she wanted some kind of experience that would prepare her for her role. So she said, uh, you know, I'd like to call you before we go into production and maybe you can take me out on the Underground Railroad. And of course, I was like, uh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> when Oprah asks you for anything, you just say yes, right? <laughs> and maybe about six weeks before the film went into production, I get a call from her studio saying, yes, Oprah said you were going to take her out on the Underground Railroad. You know, when can we schedule that? I was terrified. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. You certainly, you know, I couldn't take her on the road for eight weeks, you know, walking through five states. But what I came up with was an idea of a parallel experience. I figured that for her role, she was going to probably really want a sensory experience. That, that's what it sounded like she was describing to me. So I focused on taste, touch, smell, sights, and sounds of the slavery landscape. And my idea wasn't to really take her on a historical journey or tour, you know, visiting different museums and sites and stuff like that, but to create an emotive experience that we could drop her into that would touch on all of those senses. So the idea I pitched to her was to bring her to Maryland to an old plantation we would use the landscape of the plantation 
and we would create a simulated day in the life of slavery where she would be brought, changed into slave clothing, work doing the tasks that enslaved people would have done, doing that herself, and then lead her on a guided journey for the next 24 hours through forests, across fields, the whole nine yards, the landscape of escape. And I just put it out there. I figured she'd say, hell no. (laughs) She said, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I dreamed of. And then I had to find a plantation. (laughs) (laughs) Like, how am I going to do this? So um, I gathered about five or six close friends. Harpo, Oprah's production company, wanted to pay us. She said, you know, how much do we pay you for this? And I said nothing, partly because, you know, I had a vision and I I wanted to maintain control over that. And I felt that if Oprah got from this experience something that could really put her in that space for her role, that she could not only tell a story of slavery, but actually help shift the world's mind about the story of slavery, bring it to a new level of understanding, a new kind of call for humanity. And if there was anybody on the planet who could do that, that would be over. So my my job was to equip her for the journey. So we pitched this to her. She said, yes, I assembled a crew and we spent the next month, you know, we located a old plantation that a friend of mine lived on which was in Sandy Spring. We connected that with county parkland and created a 12 mile swath through the northeastern part of the county that we could move her across where she would never see a telephone pole, a paved road or anything of the modern era, that it was all 19th century landscape. I brought down a guy from Frostburg with his bloodhounds to track her through the woods at night. Mm, oh um, my she goodness. was going to spend the first night sleeping in a barn and the next night in a cave. So the idea was just to throw it all at her. She came down, we blindfolded her, we transported her to a spot within a mile of the location where this was all going to happen. And we walked that mile. I walked that mile with her arm in arm while she was blindfolded. The idea was to, you know, disorient her so she would not know where she was. And while still blindfolded, we put her in period clothing. We did a process that I call the regression, which is like a sensory hazing, if you will. That's probably not a good way of like putting it. We use tools and elements that would you know, kind of touch on her senses. And when the blindfold came off, she would be in a different time and place. And that's what happened. And she worked on the plantation for the day. We had her interact with different actors and reenactors. I used a combination of people who were like Civil War reenactors, stage actors, and just regular people off the street. It was all unscripted. There was just a general plan. And we set up that day in the plantation house. And what I did was had all of the actors come into the house, speak with me, maybe every 15 minutes, and then they would rotate out. So I would give them a task to do, and they would do the task. Any interactions they had with people, they just did in their normal voice. So there was no acting per se and there was no script and it was all natural and it worked out really well but long to short she works that day on the plantation she's guided from it on this night journey gets to the first location and she collapses she has an emotional collapse and little did we know it at the time but the immersion was so intensive that, you know, even my staff couldn't, <laughs> couldn't go through it anymore. Oh, wow. So we didn't even 
take it past uh, one evening because it was so potent. But Oprah then goes, films Beloved. I think she spent six weeks filming it. Part of it was filmed in Cecil County, Maryland, and then the rest in uh, Philadelphia. And at the end of the shooting, her contract with King World, the production company that used to do the Oprah Winfrey show, was coming up for expiration. And everyone was speculating that Oprah was going to not renew her contract. She had started her own production company. She had a book deal to tell her story. She was talking about starting her own magazine and network. This was all in 1996. But after doing Beloved and after doing the Mersion, from what I'm told, she goes into negotiations and says, actually, I don't want to walk away from it all. I want to renew my contract, keep doing my show, but I want to change the format. And so that September, she came back with Oprah's Angel Network, the Choose Your Life Award, Remembering Your Spirit, all of the Change Your Life TV that she you know, did for another decade that really made her Oprah Winfrey. And when she was interviewed about it, and I guess someone said, you know, oh my gosh, your show and all the amazing things you're doing, like uh, what was the inspiration? And she said, I did Beloved, and it was a life-altering experience for me. And she said, and in prep for Beloved, I had my own journey on the Underground Railroad, which made me aware of the sacrifices that my ancestors made so I could be Oprah. So someone then said, well, what was this experience? And then my phone started ringing off the hook, which was interesting because at the time I had an unlisted number. And the first call I got was from the secretary of a federal judge in San Francisco who had read (laughs) about my story and wanted to know how he could get this experience. And all I remember is hearing this and I'm like, but I have an unlisted number. And she said, yeah, but I work for a federal judge. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) And from that moment, I knew there was something special. So that's why I started exploring, you know, the idea of a foundation somewhere where we could funnel people's interest in history, people's interest in the Underground Railroad, and come up with some platform, some tool for transmitting that history. I just almost started crying. That was amazing. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. I've heard bits and pieces of that story, but I've never heard it all together like that. And so... I don't even know if we've like touched on Button Farm yet, so let's get there. But is that part of what you do now? You create these experiences or is that part of it? Or tell us about today. That is what Button Farm, how we came about with the initial idea of, okay, let's let's do the Underground Railroad immersion experience, as we call it. Let's bring the experience we created for Oprah to the world. How do we do that? Oh, we need a plantation. <laughs> <laughs> wait, (laughs) it sounds like a lot of work. So we chose Button Farm after spending a few years and, you know, just regular startup office space. And Button Farm is located inside of the boundaries of Seneca Creek State Park. It's under what's called a curatorship program. So we have a long-term lease uh, through Department of Natural Resources here in Maryland. We have a farm with a farmhouse and outbuildings and about 40 acres of land right now. And we run it as a living history center. We depict 1850s plantation life in Maryland. And we do that through educational uh, and experiential programs. We grow crops that were grown in 19th century Montgomery County. That's one way we tell the story. We have heritage breed animals that they would have had on 19th century farms here in the county. And so we have a physical landscape inside of a 6,000 acre park to help us tell the story. 
And that's what we've been building upon some of our programs. We work with period craft and, um, you know, artisans, you know, blacksmiths and cooks and weavers and all that kind of stuff for some of our programs. Our programs touch on history, environmental and agricultural sustainability. And we also operate as a community farm. So there's lots of programming and activities that aren't generated by us, but we, you know, provide the place for those to happen. We had hoped that 2020 was supposed to be our big year. We were supposed to launch a public version of the Underground Railroad Immersion Experience. COVID kicked that to the curb. Uh, it will not happen in 2021 either, but it will happen in 2022. So, so that'll be a version of what you did for Oprah. Will it be a multi-day experience? Will it like what will that be like overnight? So we have been for the past few years kind of beta testing elements of what we did with Oprah for the general public for about 10 years now. We pulled elements from the Oprah immersion that have become the core of our school programs. And those are programs that just last a couple of hours and have tangible elements of plantation life and the story of slavery, the auction block, and the Underground Railroad. For the past few years, about 10 years as well, we have beta tested a fuller adult version of the immersion experience. Ultimately, we see it as being a two-day on-site experience and then one day of workshopping around it. So you get the experience and then you process the experience and create the roadmap that you will then use to apply that experience to your community or your workplace or social justice work or whatnot, kind of bringing it into the present. So far, we've been beta testing that with Ianla Van Zant's group out of Silver Spring. Van Zant was one of Oprah's gurus on her show, and she's actually local. So we have been for the past decade working with some of her students to do a truncated version of the adult immersion looking to put a few more things in place here at the farm. One thing that is key to our immersion is a salvaged slave cabin that we are going to be erecting uh, that's going to become the centerpiece of plantation quarter experience. So uh, the idea is to resurrect this structure here on the farm as a way of people seeing how enslaved people lived. And that'll become kind of the center of the immersion experience. So off the plate for uh, 2021, <laughs> but 2022 should be the year we launch. So have you located this cabin? It's just gotta, you just gotta get it up or are you look at Yeah, for I just have okay. to get it up. So any other things you're looking for? We could put a shout out on the podcast. <laughs> people oh, who yes. are listening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, definitely plantation era buildings that, which need a home. Okay. You know, so we have one cabin. Um, we would welcome two cabins, smokehouse, corn crib, things like those are, are what we're looking for. And we have a 17 acre field that this landscape is going to be erected in. So we have plenty of space and yeah. That is so exciting. And it's it actually, I'm surprised that this doesn't exist already. I think the same thing often. And I also usually come around to the story of slavery itself is still, no matter what anyone claims, is still so potent mm. in our history, sometimes in a visceral you can touch the residue of it type of way. Sometimes the potency is in the denial of the effects of slavery and how they still impact our society today. It's one of the things that really, or periods of history that has defined us as Americans, and we're still 
not fully aware of what that impact actually is. And we're, I think, as a nation, to some degrees, people who seek truth, but, you know, also people who are constantly looking forward. So how do you get people to look back and to look forward at the same time? So I think interpreting slavery and how do you do that? is a mixed bag. It's still a wild card. In 2015, someone from Colonial Williamsburg uh, had come to the farm for one of our programs and then went back and said, hey, there's an interesting interpretive approach these folks are doing. And so they actually recruited me as a director at Colonial Williamsburg for a year. For a year, I was living between there and the farm trying to bring about new ways of telling history and bringing about historical interpretation, Mm -hmm. which is really the field I'm in. Uh, How do you take a place? How do you take an an object? How do you take an artifact and tell its story? What what story does it want to tell? And how can you connect that with people? That's the work we do. Yeah. That's so fascinating. It it is. And I can't wait for all this stuff to evolve and to think that it's right here in our neighborhood. It's very exciting. (laughs) But I want to ask you, can you talk about your life and work as it relates to good dirt? Yes. First of all, I love the name that you have chosen for your project. Oh, where do I begin? I think for me, it all begins with the land, with the soil. Soil is where human beings come from. We are forever tied to the land. Even if we're living in big cities, even if we're the most of us kind of extricated from, you know, our agrarian past, the land is what we live on. And I think the land has a heartbeat and a pulse of its own. I think it speaks to us with every step we take. I think the biggest limitation is our ability to tap into it and to learn from its many lessons. One of the things that I find exciting about our project, we are here on land that formerly enslaved people worked on. And I believe that, you know, the story comes through the soil by getting people out and putting their hands in the soil that history and, you know, kind of streams of human experience will be transmitted, will be felt by people who touch the soil. It's also interesting that in the location where we are, Montgomery County's Agricultural Reserve, there has been a kind of back to the earth, though I'm not sure anyone calls it that, (laughs) movement of farming, of sustainability, and sustainable farming practices like green manures and rotating crops and all of that, that's not new. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That predates what has now been labeled terminologies that were, you know, kind of stamped out by, you know, a big agriculture. So one of our mottos here at the farm is everything old is uh, green again. And that simply means that the lessons of the land from the past can be accessed by people today if they seek it out. So good dirt is our bread and butter. I'm also thrilled that we have neighbors such as you (laughs) and the projects that you have uh, worked on for the past few years. Well, I think our favorite thing about the whole Letty Farmer project and all of its aspects is just being able to cultivate this, not only our our physical community here and all the, the cool progressive things that are going on in here in terms of sustainability and land usage, but the wider community too, of people that want to connect over the importance of these things and tell the stories. It's been really, really fun and exciting. And before we 
wind up this interview with you, we want to give you a chance to tell the audience, what is it that you'd most like our listeners to know about the work that you do? Is there well, anything you want to add to all the things you've already said on that score? So. Well, I would say, I, I think the most important thing about the work I'm involved with is our project has been built from the ground up by the community. And though we came here and established Button Farm with certain mission in mind for our nonprofit, we've discovered that our farm is really the community's farm. And we couldn't have a better partner. Having people come here and experience the things we do has greatly shaped our foundation's work, but it's also allowed us to see what other people are doing and to enter into some great collaborations. One collaboration that I still want to pull the trigger on is a Button Farm growing some flax yes. uh, that <laughs> yes, a yes, yes. farmer can weave into its magic. So Absolutely. You know, we're also working on a project. It's called the Chesapeake Fiber Shed. A few other more, there's a lot of like sheep, obviously, you know, that exist in the area, but not a lot of plant fibers. And this specific project, the Fiber Shed, is committed to connecting the Fiber Shed basically in our region. And I see this project also falling under Lady Farmer, but in in the wider Chesapeake Fiber Shed would be so cool. I love that. Yeah, and we okay. We've been talking within the fiber shed group about doing a flax project, so we're on Tonya. <laughs> Sounds like after the whole COVID thing clears up, you guys are going to be having a lot more foot traffic with all the projects you've got going on. Are you ready? Yeah, I think so. We, I think, last March when Maryland went under its first two week lockdown, which then turned into a two month lockdown. What we discovered was that uh, under the state regulations, state parks were considered essential businesses. Cool. So even though initially we were like, yep, we'll just be closed for the year, <laughs> um, we weren't given much of a choice. And there was the visitation to the park increased uh, threefold. People oh. were just coming down our driveway. Oh, wow. uh, by the summer, we brought in our you know, volunteers again and decided to open to the public. And we wanted to do that because we were certain at the time that we probably wouldn't see a vaccine until 2022. So, you know, how do we remain a resource for the community even through the toughest times? Mm -hmm. So we opened up and now we know that we will be able to open up in the spring and we look forward to having uh, people out just uh, experiencing what we have here and bringing their experiences to our farm. So until then, or for anyone who may be not local, how can someone find your project and follow your work and what kinds of things should they be looking out for? Is there a newsletter? Yeah. So they should be looking out for a new website. It's buttonfarm.org. Are you guys on any social or anything? Uh, Yes, we are. And it's all linked through there. Okay. So just go to the page and there's a bar and you can pick your poison. Tony, thank you so much for coming and talking with us today. It's been fascinating. I have said, wow, so many times. I know. I almost (laughs) cried, got goosebumps. This is great. You're also a great storyteller. Yeah. Well, thank Um, you. What a great conversation. (laughs) And I want to thank you because I think as a farming community, As a destination community, as a community of dreamers and thinkers, we have to be able to, uh, what, walk and chew gum at the same time? (laughs) Yeah. Can't just be about getting a crop planted and a crop in. It's about reaching out and connecting to other people. Mm -hmm. Um, We should always be thinking, you know, what's the last step in this? So, you know, when you're breaking soil, the last step is something you planted is going to go in someone's mouth and it's going to give them strength and sustenance and get them through their next day. So I love the fact that you're doing this podcast. This helps get the word out and just keep us connected. And I'm really honored to be included in this. So thank you. Well, thank you. That's such a great way to put it. Thanks again, Tony. Wow, 
Wow, Emma, did you learn something from that that you didn't know before? Yeah, I learned a lot of stuff. I don't think I ever realized before this conversation, like my picture of the Underground Railroad was, you know, really set in stone paths and like a map, like a treasure map and like these safe houses. And I guess I didn't understand until after hearing Tony explain it that actually a lot of times it was much looser than that. And it was a lot of storytelling and codes and it was just so much more kind of complex and nuanced than that. Yeah. And I think his whole work is to try to get people to really understand about it and what it was and what people were going through and trying to escape slavery. Yeah. And I love how he's so committed to the sensory experience of it. Not just talking about it, but really committing to sharing what it was really felt like, what it sounded like. Yeah. And how exciting is it that his work includes our farm property? I feel like a real part of history there. Yeah. So we really hope that you enjoyed this episode as much as we did. We plan to stay in touch with Tony and everything going on over there at Button Farm. And we'd love to see what the rest of these projects he's talking about in this episode, how they come to fruition. And we'll keep you guys updated for sure. Yeah. And if you haven't joined us already in the Slow Living Challenge, definitely there's so much going on. It's really fun really easy to sign in it's free if you want to join the grow your own spring planting intensive as we described at the beginning of the episode you can find that on our lady farmer website under events and of course if you're enjoying this podcast make sure that you're subscribed and you rate us and leave us a review so that other people can find us share with a friend if you liked this episode and tell us what you think of it at we are lady farmer on instagram and gosh we just we really love putting up these episodes every week and we're so grateful to you listeners and we hope you have a good weekend and we'll see you next week goodbye